News Up Close, I'm Stephen I. Weiss. In this week's episode, we'll look at the impact of the American experience on religion and Jews from several different perspectives. For New York Times bestselling author Jeff Charlotte, it's possible to tease out an idea of something uniquely American in religion and how we've talked about religion over the past century and a half. We discuss his anthology, Radiant Truths. For Jews arriving in America at the turn of the last century, the struggle with that change was written clearly in questions for an advice column in the Yiddish Forward. Examining those letters from a contemporary perspective and with illustrations is graphic novelist Liana Fink in her book, A Bintel Brief. And finally this week, for celebrity ghostwriter Michael Malice, the most famous person he's preserved in memoir is unquestionably the recently deceased North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il. As a Jew who fled the Soviet Union, adding his own voice to those critical of the oppression in what's called a People's Republic is personally meaningful, as he discusses in his book, Dear Reader. But first, here's my interview with Jeff Charlotte. So you've been exploring uh, American religion for uh, more than a decade now. And with this anthology, uh, you're tr it seems like what you're trying to do is tr is to show kind of what American re what an American religion is, and what is it a religion in America? Well, I like that phrase, "what an American religion is," because of course uh, there is none, but there is very much a, a, a kind of cacophonous feel to this collection as there is to American religion. And you know, the polite term for this is pluralism. Um, I, I prefer a kind of a, a more chaotic sense, which is more vibrant and people disagreeing. And and one of the things I've learned traveling around the United States for, for now years and years, um, and you look, you always sort of wonder, is there sort of a common denominator? Is there is there such a thing as an American religion? No, not really. It, what's interesting is that as you're, as you're weaving together this journalistic uh, growth uh, or, or, or trajectory, and this religious trajectory that they're inter that they're uh, intertwined in a way that it's always spoken to me as a religion journalist that there's a there's a first amendment that speaks yes. to speech yeah, and that speaks yeah, exactly. to religion right and and that you find that in faith and in journalism on faith yeah yeah exactly i mean uh you know you mentioned it begins with whitman and for me uh the genre, this genre, this of documentary prose, this kind of writing, not just what's going on in, in a particular religious world, but what it feels like to believe, and what it feels like to believe something that maybe you don't, to enter someone else's world. Um, and that really begins in, in the Civil War with Walt Whitman's, to my mind, his greatest book, which is Specimen Days, not Leaves of Grass. And he describes sort of sitting by the bedsides of the wounded soldiers with his blood smudged little notebooks and people would want to sing hymns so he would sing hymns with them. They would ask him if he believed in God like they did and he says, well, close enough. Um, and, you know, and he ended up sort of inventing a new form in order to, to document that, to get into that, that kind of radical subjectivity. It's not just the individualism of Whitman, but of what it feels like to be a Civil War soldier who is facing death and, and thinking of, of God. Sometimes journalism on religion is about the exotic. It's, yeah. it's about what's unusual and, and finding something that's so out there that you can bring it home and, uh, and, and tell everybody, you're not going to believe what I saw. And I mean, some of that has characterized some of your work, <laughs> and some of that characterizes some of the work uh, of, of, the, of the authors you, uh, you chronicle. I mean, you have H.L. Mencken talking about uh, crawling around uh, to, 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 get to, uh, to get to a religious scene. Mencken was a hard one for me. I don't really like Mencken. I think he's such a cranky, unpleasant. He's not a nice person. He's not a nice person. Um, not that that's a not standard that for. Not journalists <laughs> not, Most journalists are not. Um, and might be, some might say that's an asset in this career. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for him, I mean, that, you know, because Mencken's coverage of the Scopes monkey trial, the famous evolution trial, there's a way in which that's one of the, the many creation myths of where does a certain kind of storytelling about American religion begin in 1925. And he goes and he sees religion that is very ordinary, but to him it's very exotic. I mean, so, you know, what's exotic here? Um, I, well, my, Southern. It's Southern, it's right. I mean, well, he's from Baltimore. It's not like he couldn't find uh, uh, that here. I mean, in the same way that, you know, some years ago, uh, Nick Kristoff at the Times uh, discovered that there were Pentecostals in the newsroom of the New York Times, as if New York City wasn't the biggest Pentecostal city in America. It was exotic 
if you, you know, if you go from here to here to there and don't really look around. And now, exploring the Yiddish stories of integration in translation and with illustration is Liana Fink. Bintel Brief was a column in the forward, in the Yiddish forward, uh, with, started by Abraham Khan. The population at that time was mostly immigrants or immigrants' children uh, who were writing in Yiddish and, and pouring their hearts out in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, they were so intense. The first letter that was written by this woman who signed anonymous because she didn't want to be revealed in the paper, and I think they had like a political advice column, but she was writing in with this very personal letter that was unheard of in the forward at the time, and she said, please, please print my letter. I, I know that I have a feeling that my neighbor stole my, my watch, which is the only valuable item that I own, and without without this watch that I can bring to a pawn shop, my family is going to starve when, when we don't have any work. And it turned, at first, Abraham Kahan, who is the editor of The Forward, thought that, that she was writing to be nasty to her neighbor and she just wanted to shame her in front of everyone. And then he realized that she was writing, she, she wanted to speak to her neighbor anonymously through the newspaper in this very in this very anonymous way so that her neighbor wouldn't would, like wouldn't have to be confronted in person and could give back the watch and they could pretend nothing ever happened so i don't know it was just this very direct thing that was so unusual and it and 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 all the letters have this like urgent urgent and urgent quality that you wouldn't expect in an advice column, like they seem like matters of life and death, a lot of them. The, one of the most drawing intensive uh, elements is this, the gallery of the missing husbands. And you have all these portraits just made out, their name and their age and their portrait. I went to an etching studio and I, while I was doing that, I heard of the gallery of missing husbands, which was a spin-off of the Bintel Brief. There were so many women writing into the Bintel Brief saying, my husband has disappeared. Can you help, can readers of the forward help me find him? And a lot of these men had come to the new country and in their new freedom had found new women. And a lot of them just couldn't take the burden of, of not being able to support their families and couldn't stand letting their families down. And they disappeared and some of them died. But there was just this like, this glut of, of women who had been abandoned and not, not even divorced so they couldn't remarry. And they would write in with photographs and I made these etchings based on them. And it was a lot of fun for me because I've had a lot of um, dating experience, I guess, and <laughs> a lot of anger. At, at a lot of men. You felt like putting their pictures out? Yeah. Uh, on, I on feel like. Posts and what have you. Yeah, I think a lot of these guys have a little bit of men I've dated in them. And finally, discussing the dear leader in Dear Reader, Michael Malice. So you've been a ghostwriter to some of the some of the people who might have done bad things to our culture. Uh, po poison front man, Brett Michael. Yes. Uh, you've uh, co-written uh, books with uh, D.L. Hughley. Yes. And other major figures in our culture. This is a significant departure. This is you uh, imagining your co-author as uh, Kim Jong-il. That's, the the, that's correct. The late dictator from North Korea who has nothing to do with our culture and has complete contempt for everything in our culture and our liberal values. Uh, so it was quite a departure, and I, basically I invented a new genre. I took, you know, armfuls of propaganda when I was in North Korea, and I adapted it to a first-person narrative of his life, so people can kind of have an entertaining look at this horror that's going on over there. What was your, what was the motivation in in putting together a book of this kind? Uh, it's in one sense feeding off your prior career, sure, but in another way, it's 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 showing this regime in a light with that really couldn't happen in a different way. Right. Well, I, I, th I think, you know, being Jewish and being from the Soviet Union, you know, a lot of times growing up, you know, in school, there was a lot of hand-wringing about, oh, my, how, how, could the Holocaust have, how could the Holocaust have happened? We have to make sure these kinds of things never happen again, and it's happening right now. There's hundreds of thousands of, peop hundreds of, thousands of Korean people in concentration camps. You can see them on Google Earth, 
and the media wants to talk about how a basketball player is going over there and is palling around with the leader. It's, it's just absolutely mind-boggling to me. And I don't think people are aware that they have had these camps for decades, that you have things that like children being beaten to death in front of their class for stealing corn because they're starving. You have things like, you know, people having their limbs cut off and they still have to report to work for defying the guards. And these Gar these prisoners are taught explicitly that if we're ever invaded, you will all be killed and these camps will be burnt down and that they're not human beings because they've defied the regime. So it's a completely nightmarish scenario. And I think just as Jews, it behooves us to at least be knowledgeable about what's going on over there. I don't know that we can do anything about it per se, uh, but being an author, I felt I've got to give these people somewhat of a voice and I want to do it in an entertaining manner. The book's funny and you can read it on a plane, but at the same time when you get the, the, the candy, you get the medicine. And I think m the most effective ways to spread dark thoughts and dark ideas is through something that's palatable because the human mind isn't really capable of dealing with such horrors. You went to North Korea. A lot of people write about North Korea. Not a lot of people go there. Sure. What did you find? Going there was very telling because it, it one of the things that really struck close to home for my family, what I grew up with, is how these people are extraordinarily poor and they could not be more oppressed. It's the least free nation on earth. But the amount of pride they have in their lives and their appearance and how they carry themselves and in how much, you know, how much normalcy there was in North Korea. You have grandmothers, you know, walking with their grandkids in the train, just like my grandmother took me to Yeshiva back in, you know, in the 80s. So it really uh, kind of hurt my heart a lot because this could have been me very easily. So there was a great deal of empathy and affinity. And once you've been there, you start, you stop seeing it as a sort of carnival and you start seeing it really as a really major problem. And a lot of what that pride come from and that, uh, that uh, I guess, eagerness around the status quo in, in North Korea is the kind of propaganda that you've assembled into this narrative uh, in your book. Well, it's not eagerness about the status quo. I mean, these people have to smile and nod, and they know they have to pay homage to the regime. And, you know, everyone in the nation spies on one another. It's a surveillance society. Once a week, everyone in the whole country, everyone, and this has been happening for decades, has to get up and engage in a self-criticism session where before their neighbors or their classmates, they have to say what they did wrong the previous week. I was late for school. I broke a pencil. And then their classmates or their neighbors have to denounce them. Uh, so there's not a sense of, you know, a love of the status quo quo these people are very much beaten down in every possible way and there's that's but there is that you know very Jewish uh, sense of defiance and you know lack of letting this break you that's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of up close a reminder you can see the full episode of up close on the Jewish channel on cable or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player the Jewish Channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.